Scaling the Summit is a podcast developed by UN Global Pulse and the United Nations Innovation Network. The podcast explores essential elements to scale innovations in development and humanitarian contexts. It draws on relevant innovation research and shares experiences from a wide range of practitioners. Ultimately, we hope to give insight into what it takes to move from an idea to a fully scaled solution within the UN system. So we're delighted to have with us today Femi Somantri, who is with the UN Global Pulse's Asia Pacific team, and she's particularly a partnership and advocacy lead. So we've got the right words in there, I think, Femi. Thank you so much for joining us and for sharing some of your experience. Um, Perhaps I could start off by posing that question. We know that um, innovation isn't a solo act, it's a multiplayer game. We have to build networks, value networks, to create shared value, to create impact. Uh, But that means we have to find partners, we have to form relationships with them, and we have to get that relationship to perform to create value at scale. So could you explain or could you talk us through how do you approach that process? How do you find and collaborate with uh, the different stakeholders that you're involved in? Thank you, John. Uh, Good day. And thank you for the question as well. Uh, Yeah, certainly. I think I would really like to say that the process of getting stakeholders set up and also the partnership within the innovation activities is one of the most challenging partnership scheme I have ever encountered, basically. Um, First of all, like the idea of innovation can be very abstract and also innovation cannot be done alone or um, just a few people, basically. It really entails a lot of aspects, a lot of sectors. It can be multifaceted as well. So the way we usually um, sort of like uh, trying to get connected with the partners is basically through the sector. And we understand the ecosystem. We sort of like mapping the sector as well and understanding the needs, that's very, very important. So that is why here in Asia Pacific, when we are implementing innovation projects, we usually put a lot of effort and a lot of investment and also time in scoping phase. Uh, That's where we contextualize everything, contextualize also the sectors and the ability of the partners and the future ecosystem that will be the custodian of the innovation itself. Um, So then we try to find um, partners that is ready to actually accept the innovation and to to have sort of like a vision to actually sustain and scale the innovation itself. Yeah. So that's how we do it. We, We basically start from the mapping and then we sort of like talking with them, having a lot of conversation going back and forth. And it's definitely not a straightforward process, nor it's also um, a short uh, period of time. So I think it needs to be nurtured, actually. And also um, it takes a lot of patience to actually reach to the point that we would like to. Yeah, that's lovely. Thank you. And and I think you've underlined this is a strategic activity. It's a long term building process. We use that word lightly, but it is about making a relationship that's actually going to work. Um, Perhaps it'd be really helpful if you could give us an example of uh, a partnership, uh, something that you've you've built that's helped carry innovation to scale. But probably the one that will be um, be that during COVID, uh, for example, that we had these events like the world's events it was an emergency then everyone's definitely have needs um and also emergency response to it and then we respond to the needs of um the government of indonesia at that time to actually understand um the the situation um not only like how many people got infected but also or maybe the hotspot well that was like sort of the first i think that was like the first um response i would say um from the government of indonesia to understand the hotspot but also actually understanding the database 
like the baseline of how all of the provinces, since Indonesia is very big, by the way, um, to understand like how they actually con collect data for um, infected person, uh, like COVID infected uh, cases, for example. And then also leading to some uh, policy question also, um, like how many people got affected and when can the, and, and specific, when can the school children go back to school, for example, because at that time that was really a big concern from the government because of um, the lack of readiness basically to to deal with um, the changing into, into digitalization for education, for example. So at that time, we actually sort of like start, uh, start from scratch and then we work with a specific government, like we need to actually scan a specific um, provincial government who will be ready to actually adopt and also um, working together with us for co-creating this um, implementation or activities basically. So we work with the West Java government at that time and then to understand and to see the hotspot first of all. And then why, why we actually choose West Java? It was because they have this digital, uh, so they call it like West Java digital surfaces at that time in which in other um, provinces, it's not actually quite apparent this kind of things and you don't have this kind of facility. So we thought for um, a good pilot, which will be actually useful for scalable scalability and also replicability to other um, provincial government that we need to actually scan which one is the most ready um, to actually working with us, you know, co-create these things. So we work with the West Java government and then started to understand the data ecosystem there also um, the sectors and um, basically the players, the actors who will be involved, which um, ministries or department in provincial government, for example, is it health, is it education, basically everyone at that time. So we had a lot of um, sort of like initial user research, but it needs to be done very urgently because of the urgent situation. We didn't have the luxury of a very long process of user research, for example, uh, because of the situation. But then we jump into uh, starting to create uh, this prototype or the dashboard to um, to inform a decision of um, any kind of policy uh, recommendation or policy question, basically um, leveraged by the gov with the government. So when at that time we also because we also work on the question of um, school children and school. We also work with UNICEF, for example. We um, join hand with UNICEF on that. And then on mobility, we actually work with like local apps on traffic. Uh, it's called Waze. And then we started using the Facebook mobility, um, um, mobility data and so on and so forth. So it's really, very, I would say it's very iterative as well, but along the way, a lot of stakeholders is actually identified and also not only identified, but some of them actually approach us as well. Um, when they see an innovation is actually working out, um, they will actually come and offer the support to actually be part of that innovation. So I think that's very fascinating in a way that it's create a new ecosystem, I would say. And in the end, um, the advocacy part is actually quite um, quite interesting, but also challenging in, at the same time. Um, then we finally be able to present the work to the governor of the uh, West Java province. And also we talk with the... Um, the, the, like the main stakeholders that will be like potential custodian of the, or potential user basically for this prototype. And the prototype, the dashboard has finally been um, also posted and be part of like the command spelling system basically. So yeah, that was one of the, I would say like a success story of how we create a failure network 
um, and we build like the ecosystem, the network that will serve to that specific innovation. And then we fully handed over the um, innovation tools to the um, government of West Java. That's great. That's a super example. Thank you. And, and I guess it draws out the fact that there are multiple players, multiple stakeholders. You've listed a few of them. Um, also very interesting, the idea of piloting, of learning in one area, West Java, and then using that to replicate, but also, I guess, contextualize, because West Java won't be the same as some of the other provinces. So it's Obviously. it's a kind of learning thing. One thing that strikes me from this is the idea that you, you're beginning to get a process, that you don't just say, oh, we have an innovation we want to scale. You've got a process for doing it, and you're beginning to build some tools to help you do it. Tools might be frameworks for formalizing the relationship or tools for mapping. But I wonder, could you comment a bit about the, the learning you've had, you and your team, around the process and the tools to help build networks? It's obviously... Um, a very iterative experience. We started from scratch, as I mentioned earlier, then it's really a lot of, um, because it's very, I mean, like in innovation, it's very much iterative. So a lot of pivoting, a lot of adaptation, basically, a lot of um, changing needs. Um, and also because of the situation as well at that time, um, COVID is very, very unpredictable and very, a lot of uncertainty and also risk as well. Um, so we need to take a lot of risk uh, to actually be voting a lot, basically. And the policy question changing a lot also. I think in six months, it can also change into like suddenly two to five our policy question from school and then change to uh, the public services, changing to the mask, um, you know, like how, how many people wearing masks and how it's, um, it's uh, how is it utilized, for example. And so, so many things basically. And then we, we need to prioritize. And again, with this multi, multi stakeholders, multi players, it's really giving a lot of good insights, obviously, and giving a lot of perspective, but also the risk that we face is really a lot of question and a lot of expectation, not to mention a lot of um, um, a lot of requests on uh, doing this, doing that, uh, changing this, changing that, for example. So we need to be very agile and also very responsive to the changes as well. Um, in terms of project management, it's really quite an experience, I would say. Yeah. Yes, I can imagine that, yeah. Um, but I think we're all trying to accumulate the knowledge. That's why we have this community of practice around scaling, trying to share what we're learning about this very big challenge of moving from successful pilot to impact at scale. Um, yeah. Perhaps I could then push a little bit more. It's, it's been a, a learning journey. What have you learned? If you were to pull out some, so what are the three key do's and maybe some of the things that you shouldn't do? There's the three key don'ts. Just any lessons you might draw from your continuing experience. First of all, uh, you need to contextualize. Contextualization is the key of a success implementation and to leverage impact. That's um, really important. And in terms of measuring, the secondly, in, in terms of measuring impact, um, I think we should also be creative in measuring impact because as we are all aware of, innovation impact is really quite subjective, I would say. Um, so being able to or actually task and we are expect as a UN agencies or entity we are tasked to actually explain the impact so by that um, we understand that many different ways and many creative way to actually um, you know telling impact stories and understanding the impact as well and I think the most important thing that we learn um, during the process for all the innovation project implementation, it's actually the impact 
is not actually the result of the project or not the prototype itself, but actually the process and how we change the way of thinking, the way of working and introducing new approaches, for example. And it has changed sort of like the behavioral impact, the um, the behavioral and also operation of our counterpart. And that is very much um, rewarding, I would say. When we go back to a, a unit that was um, helping us or supporting in co-creation on MSME's dashboard, for example, or the strategic foresight for MSME that has been adopted by the government of Indonesia to actually advise the long-term national development planning, that is very rewarding. And they said to us, uh, at this point, because we work with you, now we always thought um, in different way. We always think about innovation. We always um, think about data, how we can do with data, how um, all the pulses can also be data sources, for example. And every time we have a planning meeting, for example, this is Minister of uh, Planning um, uh, saying, let's say we always think about strategic foresight, for example, that kind of thing is very much rewarded to us. So again, I think my second point will be that the process is really important and measuring impact should also be a creative process of innovation. Um, thirdly, is actually more into the stakeholders itself um, that we need to also be open to any stakeholders that approach us and also um, be open-minded on any non-traditional potential stakeholders. We, we can actually thought that these specific stakeholders is not really relevant, but in the end, it's, you know, like it has contributed a lot to our projects, for example. So it's a learning process, everyday learning process. And we found something new every day, usually in a very good um, implement project implementation, basically. Yeah. I think that's like the three top uh, lesson learned. That, that's really helpful. And, and, and I think it, it, it uh... It underlines the point that this is a, a learning process. You said it's iterative and so on, but you're clearly accumulating some knowledge which you can deploy into the future. Um, I have to ask, I'm just a challenging academic here, but uh, uh, any lessons about what not to do? Anything you've, any mistakes or any, any things that you uh, uh, think, hmm, maybe that wasn't the best approach, we'll learn from that. Anything in that direction at all? Um, I would say the most important thing is don't assume. Just don't assume. Yeah. I mean, like when you assume things, it's okay to have assumption, but then you have to really do ground truthing. Um, that's kind of part of contextualization, I would say. Once you assume, um, I think it's, you know, like usually you're taking risk of making it um unscalable and also not sustainable as well. That's a lovely one. And uh, often I have in mind this idea as we're talking about building networks, it's a little bit like a chessboard. And the danger is we then think they're just simple pieces with clear identities that move in particular ways. People and organizations aren't like that. So I think you made a super point there. We mustn't make assumptions. We need to contextualize. Femi, thank you so much. That's been really helpful. There's some great insights there. And I'm sure if people want to follow further, they can contact you. But for now, thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And also, um, I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much. <laughs>